Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense. Common knowledge. Or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do. But only 0.1% a real Jesus. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast. I have uh, James Collins. He's an associate professor at University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center. You know, near Dallas. And we're going to talk about uh, a particular parasite called the schistosome. There are many parasites out there, and uh, I guess this one affects hundreds of millions of uh, the world's poorest people. So we're going to talk about that. And uh, thanks for coming, James. Thanks for having me, Richard. This is fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, tell me about your, your work. Why, why the focus on this parasite and what's been your background? I'm not a card-carrying parasitologist per se. So I, I kind of came to work on um, schistosomes from a, you know, a, a different background. So, I'm, you know, I was trained as a geneticist, a molecular geneticist and a developmental biologist. Um, and I really got my introduction to schistosomes when I was working on their free living relatives, you know, which is an organism known as a planarian. I know you might remember these guys from high school biology. These are the ones you can chop off their head and they regrow their mm. head very rapidly. You can jump them into a bunch of pieces and they, you know, each one of the little pieces can make a whole new worm. And so I got really interested in that as a um, graduate student and went to um, one of the preeminent labs working on planarian biology as a postdoctoral yeah. research fellow. And then, um, you know, I started studying planarian reproductive biology, and I, I just kind of became amazed with all of the amazing reproductive biology that kind of occurs throughout the flatworms, this, this phylum known as platyhelminthes. And it, it eventually led me to start reading more and more about these parasites, and in particular, the schistosome, which is really the most devastating of all the parasitic flatworms. And I kind of looked at the research landscape, and I kind of saw that a lot of the biology that I was trying to understand in a planarian was very much kind of unexplored in the schistosome. And so I kind of, I, I rolled the dice and, um, you know, I, I just started taking some of the tricks and tools, you know, I'd kind of learned from working on planarians and started applying them to schistosomes. And that's kind of what I've been doing now for a little over a decade. Well, why is schistosome important to you? Just because it's so deadly or, or well, other reasons? You know, before, before I, you know, before, again, I, I, I wasn't trained as a parasitologist. So, you know, when I started, I had no idea what a schistosome even was. But, you know, the more and more I started reading, I, I said, like, you know, I, I looked at them and I said, this is a really devastating disease. I mean, it, schistosomes infect 200 million of the world's poorest people. They kill a quarter of a million people every year. And, you know, and it's not just it's not just the death associated with it. This is a chronic disease that basically um, people who are infected, the, the consequences of being infected, they may not necessarily kill you, but they certainly will kill your chances of being able to pull yourself out of poverty. And so, um, you know, schistosomiasis, the, 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 the disease that these guys cause is, you know, one of, the, one of what it's called so-called neglected tropical diseases. And one of, the, one of the distinguishing features of these neglected tropical diseases is they predominantly affect the poorest of the poor and as a result of having these diseases, you know, people who are infected with these parasites are never able to pull themselves out of poverty if given the opportunity because they just don't feel well enough or um, yeah. they're, they're, dis they're disfigured. You know, they have elephantitis or um, they're, they're, there's a variety of these diseases and, you know, and, and they don't get this sort of respect or attention that they deserve. You know, very few people, you know, schistosomiasis affects 200 million people. There's only a small handful of labs around the world focusing on these parasites. I mean, there's there's a lot of very rare genetic diseases that have much larger research communities than does schistosomiasis or, you know, lymphatic filariasis or, or any one of these neglected tropical diseases. And so there really is an amazing opportunity to kind of carve out your own niche and do something that's, you know, really important, ask really important biological questions, but also apply what you learn to um, something that affects a lot of people. And so that's that I kind of saw that and I, I, just, I just saw it as a, as a really fantastic opportunity to understand, to kind of do the kind of science I love, but also try to make an impact. So how do people get schistosomiasis and what's the like the street name for it? Is it called that or something else? <laughs> yeah. So, 
there there are some there are some street names, um, but they're not they're not really that catchy. One of them is like Snail Fever, and the reason it's called um, one of the street names is Snail Fever is just a sense of an incredibly complex life cycle. So uh, I'll kind of go through it. So you, if you're infected with a schistosome, these worms are inside you. They're living inside your blood and they're laying eggs. Okay. And these eggs are then somehow through mechanisms we don't quite understand, somehow passage from your blood um, out into the lumen of your intestine or your bladder. And then you pee or poop these things out. Okay. Um, then this is really only the start. So then these eggs reach fresh water, okay? And so in the poorest parts of the world, you know, people, the, the water, the, the, the people's waste products end up in the streams, end up in lakes. And when that happens, the eggs inside the um, waste material basically um, liberate a larval form, okay? Which is called a myricidium, which kind of looks like a little, um, they're, they're look, look like a little furry ball of, cause it's covered in these finger-like projections called cilia and they kind of zip through the water and they infect a snail, okay? And this is really a key part of the parasite's development. Once they go inside the snail, they're able to make, potent, you know, basically, Im they're basically immortalized inside the snail. They can make millions of, potentially millions and millions of copies of themselves, genetically identi identical clones of themselves um, using a, a, a very, you know, poorly understood population of stem cells. So these stem cells in the, um, that they, from the myricidia, they undergo um, divisions and they undergo asexual embryogenesis and they make another larval form called a sporocyst. And inside this sporocyst, another organism develops called a cercaria. And these cercaria then burst out of the snail and the cercaria then go into the water. And the cercaria are attracted by movement, by oils from your skin. And once they kind of detect a human, um, they'll, they'll swim up to them and penetrate their skin very rapidly, okay, within seconds. And once they've done that, now they're in your body and they'll enter your, they'll basically wiggle through your tissue, enter your blood, and then they'll develop to adults and start reproducing again, okay, start laying eggs. Okay, so that's, that's the basic life cycle. So how, how do they make you sick? Well, it turns out that once they're, the, the, the process of getting these eggs from your blood out of the body is a relatively inefficient process. So about half of the eggs they lay get outside the body. The other half of the eggs they lay end up getting stuck in your organs, okay? And that induces inflammatory responses that basically wreaks havoc on your tissues. This can be the liver, um, this can be the bladder, um, and this can result in organ failure. But in some cases, in, in schistosomes that infect the urinary tract, they can actually cause cancer from the eggs getting stuck in, um, in the bladder. So there's 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 a variety of consequences of these um, of these eggs um, from the parasites, and they, it's not just it's not just your liver. I mean, they can get stuck in your spinal cord, they can get stuck in your brain, um, but it's really the the pathogenesis of this disease is really driven by the egg production. And so that was one of the reasons I said that I was interested in schistosomes is uh, one of the reasons is that they have this amazing reproductive biology um, that, that in many ways I saw being very similar to the kind of amazing reproductive biology that exists throughout platyhelminthes. And it's this re really cool reproductive biology that is really the driver of the, dis the disease. If you actually block schistosomes from being able to produce eggs, there's very few consequences for people who are infected. So um, really, fundamentally, it's a disease driven by this egg production. It's yeah. in snails. They burst out of snails and what, they kill the snails and then the schistosome is just, is it a, a single cell or a multi-cell type of yeah. worm? Yeah, so they're, uh, yeah, so these things are worms, they're multicellular. Okay. Um, and so the organisms, the cercaria the, that, that come out of the snail, you know, they're, they're a, a, a thousand cells or so, I would, you know, I'd estimate. And they don't necessarily kill the snail. They can reproduce in the snail for a long time. In fact, you can, you can actually take the, um, the sporocysts that, that, the, that release the cercaria from the snail, and you can actually ser you can serially transplant them to snails um, indefinitely. So those sporocysts basically are mortal. You can take some of them from one snail, put them in another snail, They'll grow, and then you could do that again and again and again. And so they basically have the capacity to produce these infectious larvae forever, and that's it's really key to the to the success of the pathogen of the parasite, because you can take a very r rare event, which is a, a myricidium, 
that comes from an egg infecting a snail. And you can basically amplify the ability of that rare event to successfully infect a human. That's really the, this, the snail part is really the most critical part of the, of the life cycle for ensuring the success of these pathogens. And, you know, they have this really complicated sort of biology and this complicated life cycle. And it doesn't seem like it really should work. It doesn't seem like it should be that efficient, but you have to remember these parasites infect, you know, 240 million people. So this is a very efficient process. And these, these parasites are arguably some of the, are, are, are one of the most successful parasites on the planet. Um, and it's in large part due to this snail stage of their um, of their life cycle. Okay, so in the water there'll be this circarian form. Yes, yeah, circarian. Or sporulated form. Like what, what? When you say circarian, does it mean circle? Like what do they what do they look like? <laughs> so they they're 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 my favorite stage of the life cycle. They're 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 just about the coolest part. They they have this little this little head with a, and they're 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 complicated little critters. They've got a little brain. Um, they've got, you know, nerve cords. They've got a variety of sensory organs. They've got glands that they use that secrete stuff that can penetrate the skin. And that head part is attached to a um, extremely muscular tail. And at the end of the tail, it's almost like a like a fork. So there's basically two prongs sticking off of this um, kind of long tail. So this is a, a really crazy looking organism. Um, but their, 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 their entire, you know, job, and they don't live for very long. They can only live for about 24 hours. Um, they don't eat, they don't sleep. They just, they just wait for a human to come by and, and so they can get in. And so, and, 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 and they're, it's really quite remarkable. You can actually do this experiment in the laboratory. You can take oil from your face and you can, um, you know, rub your thumb on your face, um, then take your thumb and make a little, uh, like fingerprint on a, on a, on a uh, Petri dish and add the mm -hmm. circaria and they'll immediately swarm to where you just uh, made your, made your mark on the, on the Petri dish. Um, they're, oh, they're wow. very, they're really remarkable creatures. And so what they, they do is they use this muscular tail to kind of zip through the water and like almost a corkscrew sort of motion. And once mm -hmm. they get to the, the, what they want to infect, basically they very rapidly shed their tail. Their tail basically just falls off and they they release stuff from these glands that they have that presumably digest your skin a little and then they just kind of wiggle themselves in there and now they're in and once they're in they're basically you know another remarkable feature of the schistosome is you know they survive in your bloodstream at the you know basically living on the front lines of the host immune response for decades and it doesn't really seem to bother them they're all, it's almost like they're invisible to the immune system um, at least they're not, you know, they're not subject to being killed by the immune system when they're healthy. So it's, um, you know, they're, it's a really remark. It's really remarkable that that these parasites, um, uh, you know, are, are able to do this. And you, you know, you think about that evolutionarily. You know, what sort of the, the the sort of mechanisms that they've had to devise to allow them to basically become invisible to the host for you know 30, 40 years is um, is pretty impressive. And you know, if you think about it, you know, from not just the, from the perspective of trying to understand schistosome biology, but look, I mean, if you had, think about organ transplants, one of the issues you have with organ transplants is basically the, you know, the, the host immune response basically recognizes something as foreign. That doesn't happen in the context of schistosome. So, you know, trying to understand perhaps some of the immunology of how the schistosomes are able to evade the host immune system, maybe that could give us insights into, you know, non-related problems such as, you know, um, you know, rejection and during, um, you know, uh, organ transplant, if there's special molecules that schistosome makes um, that allow them to be invisible. And, you know, so there's a, there's a, there's a tremendous number of really important fundamental questions that because this parasite doesn't really infect people in the Western world, a lot of these questions are kind of wide open. We don't really, we don't really have a lot of answers, which is, you know, at some so, level, that's a, it's a really good position to be in. If you're, if you're a biologist and you get excited about discovering new stuff. Yeah. You know, what makes people sick? When the um, I see, I'm I'm looking at a graphic of all this. I see they have like tails, and then when they get into people, they lose their tails, so they're like this egg shaped, yeah, it's just a somule, and uh, then they go to different parts of the body, and yeah. then some of them turn into adults, these weird uh, looking, strange looking worms. Um, so what what makes people sick? Do they steal nutrients? Do they well, destroy yes. linings of tissues? What do they do? If you like this podcast please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. Yeah. So, so they, they get in your blood and um, you basically, the schistosomes are unique 
um, among flatworms because they have two sexes. There's a male and a female. And basically the male hugs and holds on to the female and they meet up once they've sexually matured and they live inside and then they do this in, in your blood vessels. Okay. There they start eating blood. The female will then sexually mature and she'll start laying hundreds to thousands of eggs a day, depending on the schistosome species. Um, and the eggs are actually the central driver of the pathology or the, you know, that causes you to get sick. So if you have an infection with only male worms or only female worms, you experience almost no consequences of being infected. You probably wouldn't know you're infected. It's only when you have male and female worms together when they're producing eggs that you get really serious consequences associated with infection. So it's really, it's solely driven by the parasite's ability to produce these eggs that causes you to get sick. Is there um, competition? Like, uh, is it even between males and females or is an infection typically, you know, is an infection different if I get lots of females versus lots of males? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it takes two to tango really when it comes to getting sick. So, you know, really it's, um, if, if you, if you have a ton of males and only a few females, you won't get as sick as if you have a really more balanced infection where you have 50, 50 males and females. And, and yeah, the it, reason why what, I say is maybe it's a weird therapy, but if someone's sick, what if they deliberately then get infected by a ton more males to make the competition so intense that it slows the infection or makes it manageable? Well, uh, yeah. I mean, well, so there's some interesting there's some interesting stuff here with the um, with the females, and so it, it was recognized about a hundred years ago that the female schistosomes they absolutely rely on physical contact and coupling with the male worm to become sexually mature and lay eggs. So females, in the absence of a male parasite, fail to fail to develop. They look like little immature worms until a male holds on to them, hugs them, and induces their sexual maturation. So really, you know, you, you have to have, for every female, you have to have a male in order to get this sexual reproduction to happen. So really, the, the female is really the limiting factor for getting, um, for, for producing eggs and inducing pathology, but she has to have a male counterpart there to, sex, to stimulate her sexual maturation. Um, and it, it's really remarkable, this um, female sexual maturation upon coupling her, this male kind of hugging her and cuddling her, it only really requires the female to touch, to be in physical contact with the male. You can actually castrate the male and the female will sexually mature normally. So I like to say that, you know, in, in terms of the, the female, she's more interested in cuddling than she is in having sex. It's only about this physical contact. And then the process is reversible. So you can have a male and a female and the, the, the male will induce the female to sexually mature. But then if you take away the male, she'll regress to an immature sexual state and won't produce eggs. And so she requires constant physical contact for sexual development. So they, do they pick one partner for life? No. You know? So, yeah, I mean, they're not monogamous. I mean, they, they do they do switch partners. Um, you know, there's been some genetic studies that have kind of looked at that and said that, yeah. Um, it's not just it's not just one male and one female for the rest of their life. As as, as romantic as that is, it's 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 a little bit more promiscuous than that. Um, they they can kind of swap partners. And and the thing is, it's not even um, species specific. It turns out that one type of you know one species of female schistosome can be stimulated to sexually mature by a male of another species. So she's really not all that picky when it comes to kind of which males that she finds herself with. Um, they won't necessarily produce normal eggs um, because they, the sperm isn't there to basically generate a, 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 a normal zygote. But there are cases in the literature where basically the female, um, and, and we've reproduced these data in, um, in the laboratory, um, basically the female, she'll lay eggs that will start to develop even though she's had no sperm contribution from the male. Um, which is a process called parthenogenesis. So she'll she has um, she'll lay eggs that are basically only have her DNA um, and nothing from the father. And and this has been observed all in, in the in the in the classic literature as well. So it's there, there's some there's some really bizarre stuff going on here. And there's even it's becoming more and more clear that in the field you can actually have these um, hybrid schistosomes where a male of one species. 
is close enough is 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 close enough is related close enough to the female that they can actually generate viable offspring. Yet they're two different species and they have two different genomes, and they you could basically get these hybrid organisms. Um, and people are seeing this a lot um, in human infections. And these hybrid organisms kind of have different properties than either of the respective species. So there's a lot of weird sexual biology going on in schistosomes. So we really only scratched the surface on, you know, really understanding any of this. So what, what makes people sick? Is it, do they become anemic? Do they, you know, like, uh, does, does the reproduction happen only in the bloodstream or does it happen in other organs preferentially? And, you know, yeah, what so happens in other organs? Yeah, so it's primarily in the bloodstream, which basically goes everywhere, right, in the body. Now, when the schistosomes, typically, they're in the blood vessels surrounding either the um, the intestine or the bladder. And that kind of restricts usually where the eggs are going to get stuck. So if they're in the, um, in the veins surrounding the intestine, basically, a vast majority of the eggs are going to get stuck in the liver. And so that's just because of the way the blood is flowing. Um, the, the blood from that region of the body just goes directly to the liver. And, you know, the sinusoids of the liver basically aren't big enough. So when one of these big eggs, which is about, you know, 100 micrometers in, uh, in length, they basically very easily get stuck in the liver. And when they get stuck, it, it, they, they, the, these eggs are constantly secreting proteins that basically freak out the immune system. And the immune system attacks the eggs that are stuck in the liver. And over time, that leads basically to like a scar almost in the liver. And once you once this happens a few hundred thousand times in the liver, then the liver starts to have problems. Um, mm. and, and it could be the same thing in the bladder. Um, so it, it, what about in the, in the blood? I mean, when blood gets to the spleen, I, I would guess normally that's where cells are, uh, you know, are disposed of. In the blood, I mean, do the parasites just, are they able to stay persistent in blood or like what happens to them? They just sit there. I mean, you know, when they're adults. Like have, you, have you tried, has anyone tried to fluorescently or tag them somehow and see if they make round trips and they avoid oh. any any filtering? So one thing is once they're adults, they're very large. So they're, you know, they're about, about a, a, you know, a, over a centimeter in length. So they're, they're quite large. You can actually see them with your eyes. They've got very powerful muscular suckers that they use to hold on to the blood vessels. But when they're younger larvae, they do make multiple passes around the um, circulatory system until they basically at random find themselves in the right place in the body. So in schistosomes that infect the vein that live in the veins surrounding the intestine, once they get there, they stay there. And then they then they start to sexually mature. Um, so it's they do make multiple passes, but it's it's thought that once they're adults, they kind of just stick around in those blood vessels for a very long time. Um, do they hook into the they, wall, or what do they do? <laughs> they have the they have suckers. They have their mouth, and they have a, a, what, what's called the ventral sucker, and they just hold on and they eat blood. So they definitely you know they they acquire nutrients from the blood. They have a skin, um, which is called a tegument, which is extremely absorptive. So they can, you know, s- pull glucose and sugars and all sorts of other stuff through their skin. But then they're also munching on blood constantly and um, eating that. But, you know, usually I don't think you have enough parasites in you to really make you anemic from them eating all the blood. It's really the eggs is the, is, is the primary driver is of, um, of pathology associated with infection so have, has it been found that anything really repels them uh, or anything uh you know stops their development or causes them to go into like a spore phase yeah can so, any of that be replicated in the body yeah so i mean you know fortunately um we do have there is a therapeutic it's it's a drug called prosequantil it's um been the standard of care for over 40 years and is effective in many cases of reducing parasite burden in people who take the drug. Um, but what we're finding, the more and more we're administering prosequantil and people are doing systematic studies, um, is we're finding that it's not as effective as we had hoped. So, you know, going into a village in Africa and giving people um, a single dose of prosequantil will, uh, you know, on the whole, reduce parasite numbers and, you know, the numbers of eggs that people pass. But 
you come back to that same village the next year and basically there, oftentimes there's there's very little difference in the infection before and after treatment so it's it's clear that you know mass drug administration with prazaquantil is not going to be the sole means by which we eradicate this disease from the developing world um so i we really need um to invest in trying to understand new and better ways to control this pathogen. Um, we, we're not going to be able to rely on the drug that we have. It has a number of uh, liabilities that really make it kind of um, not ideal for um, eradication of, of, of the disease. Mm. So, yeah, so it, it, it's, a, it's, a major, it's a major goal of the community is to try to find you know, ways to enhance the efficacy of drugs like prosequantil or I identify new new drugs that can basically serve as either replacements or something that you can add in addition to prosequantil to enhance its efficacy. One of the one of the real problems with prosequantil, one, there is some evidence that parasites can become less sensitive or resistant to prosequantil, which is always a concern with any sort of drug that you use on, you know, basically incessantly for decades. But there's also, you know, schistosome, the, the schistosome is only sensitive to prosequantil at certain stages of its development in a mammal. So right after somebody is infected, their sense, the, the, the worms are sensitive to prosequantil. But then there's this lull when the parasites are juveniles or teenagers that basically prosequantil doesn't affect them anymore. So, and then once they become adults, then they're sensitive to prosequantil again. So if I was infected two weeks, if I had just a full-blown schistosome infection, I was getting infected every, you know, every few days when I went to take a shower, to take a bath um, in the lake, and you gave me prosequantil, but I had been infected a couple weeks ago, um, the worms that infected me a couple weeks ago would no longer, wouldn't be killed by prosequantil. And so then in two weeks, they'd be adult and I'd be suffering from schistosomiasis again, even though I had been given prosequantil. So it's it's clear we need to we really need to double down on our efforts to try to think of new ways of, of dealing with this problem. Hmm. Has anyone looked at uh, you know is there an associated microbiome with schistosomiasis and is, is that, it, you know how is it different through the different stages? Yeah, I mean you know so I that's a great question. I, I actually you know don't know in terms of the are, you're talking in terms of the person's microbiome. Well, that and the yeah. uh, the parasite itself. Yeah, so, so I, I mean you know we, you know. I don't, I don't actually, I don't know that the parasites, since they live in the blood, I mean, I would assume that that's a sterile environment and that they would, wouldn't have any associated microbiome, um, because I think that would make them maybe more of a liability for, you know, Im Im immune detection, but it's certainly, po it's certainly possible that there's things there that we've just never observed. There have been some studies looking at differences in the microbiome of people who are infected. And I think you can see differences, but, you know, some of the studies weren't controlled as well as, you know, it's a very hard sort of thing to do and, and, and in a very controlled way. So I think that the jury's still out on whether the schistosomes actually cause any sort of major deviations in um, the microbiome, but it's certainly something that deserves, um, that deserves some attention for sure. What about yeah. changes in um, immune Based parameters. Yeah. I mean, so, I mean, one of the things that, you know, is um, becoming more and more clear is that people, you know, in the, in the Western world, we have a, um, we have an increase um, and, you know, I'm going to put this up with a caveat that I'm not an immunologist, but I, you know, I, I know plenty of them, but <laughs> that the people in the Western world, there's this rise in allergic diseases, um, all sorts of allergies that we don't see in, in the developing world. And, one of the one of the dominant hypotheses now is this so-called hygiene hypothesis, where people, you know, in the Western world, where we have low incidence of infections from worms, have a higher incidence of allergic diseases, whereas in the developing world, you have a lower incidence of allergic diseases and a higher incidence of infections with worms. And so, you know, there have been studies looking at just the relation between um, certain allergies and schistosome infection, and they seem to be, you know, inversely correlated. Where if you have a high a population with a high incidence of schistosomiasis, you have a low incidence of various allergies. And so that and that that theme is popping up again and again and again with a variety of um, worm parasites. I mean, you know, like I said before, these worms have had, you know, they've had millions of years to adapt to surviving in the hostile environment of the of the immune system. And so 
they've come up with all sorts of tricks to tamp down the immune system. And so, you know, it could be the very mechanisms they use to tamp down the immune system are capable of also suppressing things, you know, suppressing instances where your your immune system goes into overdrive and responds to an allergen. And so that, you know, the the jury's still out, but I mean, there's a lot of compelling data out there to suggest that there's something going on between worms and worm infection and allergies, you know, and, and, and to the point where, you know, People have been in, you know, there have been clinical trials where people have infected people with worms to see what what kind of happens and whether there's any sort of um, positive consequences with various sort of inflammatory or um, allergic diseases. It's, it's an exciting time, actually, and there's there's a lot to be learned. And I think there's a tremendous opportunity. I think these these worms, um, you know, they've they've learned a lot about us, and I think we need to start using um, the tools available to start learning more and more about them. Yeah, very interesting. So, what's uh, is there a particular part of the schistosome or the schistosomiasis that you want to figure out, you know, most earnestly? Yeah. So, you know, there's a few things that you know I'm kind of focused on. Um, two main aspects of their biology that really fascinate me. One aspect is that they they survive for decades inside of your blood. And I want to understand the the, the developmental mechanisms by which they do that. And so. In the case of, you know, I, I told you I originally got interested in schistosomes because of my fascination with free living planarian flatworms um, that have this amazing regenerative potential. And the reason planarians are able to regenerate is they've got these stem cells called neoblasts, which basically rejuvenate all of their tissues. And so when I started working on schistosomes, I thought, well, you know, they could survive inside of a host for decades. How are they able to do that? How are they able to repair their tissues if they get old? How are they able to, you know, if they get damaged by the immune system, how are they able to repair themselves? Do they have stem cells that that resemble the stem cells that their free living cousins or the the, the planarians that that they use to to you know regrow a head after they've been amputated? And so we looked. Um, uh, you know, it's it's been uh, several years now, but we found that schistosomes actually have stem cells that in ver- in many ways do exactly the same sort of biology that the planarian stem cells do. And now the more and more we're looking, it seems that these stem cells are in present in every flatworm um, that we can that we can find. And it seems to be something that's shared among uh, basically that's common to, to most, most, if not all flatworms. Um, and so what we're doing is trying to understand what the stem cells are doing in the schistosome um, and how they're contributing to the parasite's um, longevity. So that that's that's one area where we're really putting a lot of effort into. And then the other area kind of deals with this the genesis of the pathology, which is the fact that these parasites lay so many eggs. And we're trying to understand the sorts of developmental mechanisms that control how the parasites sexually mature and how they um, produce so many eggs. And in particular, we're interested in this phenomenon where the male worm stimulates the female worm to sexually develop. And so we're developing a variety of tools um, to try to molecularly characterize various cell populations in the males and the female worms. And we're using newer genomic technologies to try to um, determine um, how, when males and females come together, what sort of changes happen to these worms. And can we identify molecules that are responsible for mediating some of these changes? And are these molecules important for in- inducing the, these, these sexual changes that happen in the female worm um, upon coupling with the male worm? And from a therapeutic standpoint, either of these targeting the parasite's longevity or targeting the parasite's reproductive output um, would have you know, beneficial you know, results if we were able to identify drugs, for instance, that blocked either of these two processes. Um, they could effectively blunt the pathogenesis of this disease. So, um, you know, we're asking kind of fundamental questions about the biology of the organism. But what we really hope to do ultimately is apply what we learn to developing new drugs. Interesting. So um, last question here, you said some people will have the parasites in their blood for decades. Like, how is that known? And they, they just have no symptomology or is it, is it periodically well, what happens? Yeah. So, I mean, I don't know any of these people, but you know, there's, I, I would say, I would argue there's probably hundreds of case reports in the literature. Basically people, the way, the way they know this is, um, you know, people grow up in endemic regions. So you grow up in some part of sub-Saharan Africa and you move to Houston where, you know, you don't have schistosomiasis, you don't have schistosomes, you don't have the right snails. And these people, they, you know, they moved when they were children. And they grew up in Houston. Maybe they moved to Denver and um, they've 20, they're 35, 40 years old. They've never been back to Africa. 
and they go to the doctor. I'm not feeling that well. And they said, oh, you've got schistosomes. <laughs> you've got a schistosome infection. And over the life cycle, these parasites, they don't replicate. They don't divide in your blood. They don't reproduce in your blood. They lay eggs in your blood. The only part where they make new schistosomes is in the snail. So it, basically, these are the exact same worms that person was infected with when they were a child. Um, and there are tons of case reports showing that this is that this is what happens. So it, it, it's 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 clear that these parasites have incredible longevity and they can lay eggs for an incredibly long time. I mean, we don't know if these are extreme examples, um, but the examples we have, there's lots of them. So it suggests that this is not an uncommon occurrence that these worms can survive in your blood for at least 30 years as they have the potential to do that. Yeah. Mm. Do we know when, again, if someone will have it for a while and all of a sudden they'll get sicker? You know, the, you know, <laughs> yeah, the I worms mean, you will, know, will, will... I mean, will there's attack. a lot of people, a lot of people who are infected with schistosomes that they won't know they're infected. And it, it depends kind of on your, on your burden, um, you know, how many worms you have. But there are instances where some people just get sicker than others, and it's not really clear why that happens. Um, but certainly worm burden, the amount of worms that you have and how many eggs they're laying. Um, is certainly a driver of how sick somebody gets. And so, you know, you can imagine if you're, if you have a low level infection, maybe you don't notice, but maybe over 30 years, you know, you get enough eggs stuck in your liver, then you start to, you start not to feel well. And, you know, a lot of this damage that can happen in your tissues is stuff that's never repaired effectively. So it, it can come, it can basically get worse and worse over time, especially if the worms keep laying eggs. So, you know, it's really a, a context dependent sort of thing. Yeah. Okay. Sheesh. Yeah, there's a lot to know there. So what's the best way for people to find out more about your work? Well, I've got a website, uh, www.collinslab.org. I've got some information on there. I've got links to um, other places that have other, that have, you know, more information. There's a lot out there. And, um, you know, if you're interested, you know, shoot me an email. Okay, very good. Well, Jim, yeah. thanks for coming on the podcast. Well, hey, thanks for having me. This was a lot of fun. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.